Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, discuss the art and the science of the stuff that we're putting on our feet. I'm Andrea Myers, and today we have a very special guest with us, Shannon Thompson, who's a mental performance consultant who works with the Northern Arizona University running teams, um, elite and professional endurance athletes from all around the world. Um, I got to know Shannon, I think, a couple of years ago when I took one of her online mental performance intensives, and I just got so much out of it. And thankfully, Shannon agreed to join me on the podcast today so she can share her vast knowledge and experience with all of our listeners. Um, Just a little bit about Shannon's background. She has an undergraduate degree in psychology, as well as a master's in applied positive psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. She works out of Hypo 2. Um, and like I said, she works with a r- wide range of clients, including elite and professionals. So um, when I took her mental performance intensive, it was really cool to have some of the members of the NAZ elite team join and share their thoughts and experience. Um, It's really nice to know that even elite level athletes struggle with mental performance things, just like the rest of us. Um, And it was really great hearing their perspective and some of the things that they've learned and apply to their training and racing. Uh, Shannon is also a runner herself. She competes in races from the 800 to ultra distance trail races, which is really awesome. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much for joining us. Could you tell us a little bit about your background, both as a mental performance consultant and as a runner? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Andrea, for for having me. I remember your group. You're you're a group with I think Heather Peck, so, yeah. one of Heather Peck's groups, and they're such a good, warm. I don't know, fantastic group of people. So I've really enjoyed doing sessions with with those groups. So it's, it's I'm. I'm Grateful you asked me to, to be here. Um, so yeah, my background, um, well, I'm, I'm originally from British Columbia, Canada, so the West Coast of Canada. And uh, funnily enough, my athletic background is primarily in a sport called three-day eventing. So I rode horses for a living for a really long time, which is the first place that I got a sense to of um, I guess the power of the mind uh, with respect to performance, both as a athlete and also as a coach. Um, and then my, my social life evolved into running. I always wanted to run and my social life evolved into running. So I like did, I, um, did everything from 800 meters on the track to ultras and always at a very, you know, novice level in comparison to the athletes that I'm working with. But, you know, with running, I mean, it's, um, no matter what level you're at, I think you do experience very similar challenges. So had a little bit of taste, a uh, taste of some of the challenges uh, that athletes that I work with experience. Um, yeah, and I was in, uh, I moved to Flagstaff in 2015 and was there all the time for like just until this past spring, actually. And now I live in Philadelphia. So I'm, I'm doing the same work with the same people. I go back to Flag a lot, but just having a little, another adventure, I guess you could say. Yeah, that's great. Philadelphia is a great city. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Um, how did you, what made you decide to go into sports psychology? How did you go down that road? Yeah. So, um, in equestrian sport, it, you know, it's funny. Every people will say my sport is such a mental sport and that's Mm -hmm. just like (laughs) all sports are mental sports. Right. But that was about the first thing that was about to come out of my mouth is that's a surprisingly mental sport because people think the other horse does all the work. But, um, but I guess, you know, anytime you get seriously involved in any craft, um, they're all very mental. So I think I got a, I got a taste of how like my emotional state, my ability to focus affected how I trained, how I learned, how I competed. And then as a coach, I saw how those things affected the athletes that I coached. And I even saw how my emotional state and focus as a coach affected the athletes I coach, you know? So you're just Mm -hmm. like, Oh man, it's really, um, our mind and how we feel and what we think and what we see and how we focus really uh, impacts things like dramatically, not just minorly. So I would say it was just developing an awareness of that mostly through equestrian sport that made me want to continue 
on and do this work. Yeah. And I, you know, we're going to talk this whole episode about the effect of the mind on running and, but it's true. Our minds affect everything we do. Um, Mm -hmm. And we can apply a lot of sports psychology principles to even non-sport things in our life that we, you know, have anxiety about or are worried about doing well. So um, I, I think sport just in general teaches us a lot of lessons about life Um, how to deal with adversity, how to deal with challenges, uh, what to do when things don't really go our way. Um, So hopefully people will get a lot of good information out of this episode. I'm sure that they will. And again, Mm -hmm. thanks so much for joining us. Um, I did want to ask you, so your master's is in positive psychology. So Mm -hmm. what is that? Um, (laughs) Yeah, positive psychology. It's funny, even the field is trying to come up with a different term for it. Mm-hmm. Or has been for years because it doesn't necessarily <laughs> describe it very well. Like people, um, but basically, what positive psychology is is it's the study of what contributes to human flourishing, so mm-hmm. thriving, well-being. Um, I'd say achievement is lumped in there. Excelling. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, yeah, it's the study of uh, factors that are present or people can cultivate to to thrive and grow and have, 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 you know, optimize their well-being. I love it. And how, mm. what a better approach to sports psychology than how to flourish, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, next, before we dive into our main segment, I just want to uh, go over our subjective question. So Shannon, this <laughs> is what we ask our listeners, and they'll respond either in the comments on YouTube or send us an email. So the subjective for today is what mantra or phrase do you use to get through tough parts of training or racing? Um, Shannon, do you have like a mantra that you use? Oh yeah. I, 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 I'd say if I have a mantra, it does tend to vary kind of workout to workout or race to race to race. I find that can be true for athletes too. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd say if there was a go-to that always, um, that, that is pretty much always reliable. It's like, when I saw that question, I was like, it's, it's, it's like focusing on just the chunk of the race you're in or just the mm-hmm. chunk of the workout you're in. So, um, it could be this, this mile, this lap, this K, this interval, this, you know, and, um, yeah, if you can break a larger effort into a smaller chunk and be like, I just have to like accomplish my pace or my instructions or hold this spot in a pack for this mile or this lap or this 200. Uh, that's what I would go to. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And I would say same, like there are so many things that you can say to yourself depending on what's going on, but something I found myself saying over the past couple months, like either in a hard workout or in a race was just stay with it. Like Mm -hmm. you find that effort and then your brain can get distracted by thinking about, how many miles do I have left or the hill that's coming up at mile five or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you just stay with the effort and that kind of helps you stay in the moment too. So just lately I found that that's been very helpful for me in my training and racing. That's a good one. That's a really good one. It's funny, a a phrase that I'll use a lot, like a lot of athletes will use um, when we come up with like a focus plan for their races will be they'll, they'll select a chunk of the race where their whole goal is to like, they'll say stay attached Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that stay attached is stay attached to a pack, stay attached, stay attached to the person ahead of them. Um, but then every so often it's stay attached to the effort or stay attached yeah. to the pace. And so that mm-hmm. phrase, like you're saying, stay with it. It's like, yeah, we use that a lot. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. So mm-hmm. moving into our main segment, I thought that we could first just talk about, well, what is sports psychology and what is mental performance? Why does it matter for athletes? Um, so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what you do, um, and just in general terms, how can mental performance training help runners? Yeah, then we'll dive so, into the details. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, yeah, I would say like um, our our mental and emotional state, both in how we what I say relate to training and racing or another word for relate could be our perspective on training and racing, like what it means for us, what its significance is, what it's going to be like, what we're hoping for or expecting, like our, our perspective um, 
it really impacts our our emotional state, I would say, going into to training or racing, which is important because um, I'd say success in an endurance sport, whether it's within a workout or whether it's within a race, is influenced greatly by the state of a person's stress system. Um, and the reason for that is that, and this, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of physiotherapists and doctors, so you probably could even tell me in more detail what's actually going on in the body when they're <laughs> to the high state of exertion. But the way that I usually explain it is, um, you know, when you're at a high state of exertion within a workout or within a race, the physiology of your body or your, your is, is getting a little bit out of balance. So you're not taking in as much oxygen as maybe your body's using, you're accumulating lactate. And, um, usually you're far from actually harming yourself, you know, really at any point within a race, but our brain is really sensitive to any little shifts in imbalance in these things. And, um, so it'll, We'll freak right out, even with like just a little bit of a change, right? Yeah. So, so when um, you find yourself in that moment of high exertion, um, one of these things your brain will do is will kind of check in with your emotional state and check in with your emotional climate as to whether or not it's safe for you to continue to to, to push and continue to be in that state of imbalance. Um, and when our stress system is alarmed. Um, or like we're perceiving there's a whole lot at stake and maybe our identity or belonging in a group is on the line when we are doing a workout or, or the likelihood of us achieving our goals or any of that stuff. It's like if we perceive that to be on the line when we're doing a workout or we're doing a race, um, usually our stress system is a little, bo- a little more alarmed so that then when the body gets to that moment of high exertion, and it's checking in. It's like, gosh, I don't know if I'm OK to continue. If our stress level is high, it usually says, oh, no, we're not. And that's where it'll start to shut you down and mm-hmm. the people um, you know, won't be able to sustain their pace at the end of the race or people will blow up or whatever. Um, so I'd say um, the, probably the most directly performance related reason to work on mental training is to work on perspective and practices that help a person to see the race in a welcoming, safe way see it as a welcoming and safe environment and then Mm -hmm. have methods to stay calm and present and then help that brain feel safe throughout. Um, So yeah, from a performance perspective that, and for running particularly, I'd say that's why it's important. And I also think from a just enjoying it kind of perspective too, you know, like if we, I think it's really normal for anybody who commits a lot of time to something like training for a marathon, for example, um, it can start to feel like it really matters a lot. And we like how we like the, the time we run can matter a lot or how we stack up against others. And that can start to take away from all the potential that running has to give your life, right? Like, like all the possibilities it has to give you life, which is time outside and with good people and moving your body and being grateful to do that. So I think uh, mental training can really help a person optimize their whole, the whole experience of the sport as well. Definitely. I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's so common, not just for runners, but for anyone in a sport that is easily quantifiable to start defining yourself by those numbers and like linking your worth to those numbers. Mm -hmm. So I ran a marathon on Sunday. It didn't go how I wanted, but I've really worked on like my, my marathon time is not who I am. Mm -hmm. And even though I am disappointed in how it went, I don't feel like less of a person because it didn't go well. And I would not say that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, I would have responded the same way to like a disappointment (laughs) in a race. Um, I, I was a professional cyclist before I came back to running and my identity was very much linked to how I did in cycling because of Mm -hmm. course I was dedicating all of my time and effort to my cycling. But Mm -hmm. I think And I'm sure that we'll hit on this later, but runners, any athletes, like when you were participating in um, your, you said it was three day, what was the three three day racing? Three day eventing. Yeah, three day eventing eventing. for any question. Yeah. (laughs) So it, like if all you think of yourself as is that type of athlete, when it doesn't go well, your identity has really taken a big hit, right? And Mm -hmm. it can be devastating to have a bad performance. But Mm -hmm. if you learn how to be a more well-rounded person where you've got, where you get your value from doing other things besides your sport, 
yes, you might be disappointed because you had a bad race or a bad workout or whatever, but it's not, you know, rocking your identity to the core. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So when you work with clients, and maybe we can just start out by talking about performance anxiety, because I think that's a really common thing that people struggle with. Um, what are some techniques that you use with people to help them manage that? Because of course, some level of performance anxiety is actually good, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, um, you know, when, when it comes to, to performance anxiety or, or nerves, you know, and being nervous in the lead up to a race, um, yeah, like our, I think there's a, there's a few pretty basic human instinctive factors at play there. And uh, one of them is your, your brain and your, your mind has noticed that you're entering a space where there's a challenge to be met that matters to you. Um, and so that, that presents the possibility of pleasure and reward. And it also presents the possibility of pain and disappointment. And um, so the, the brain is aware that this is an environment that could, could cause any of those things. Um, and then the other thing is, is our brain really doesn't deal well with the unknown. Like it really struggles with that. It's a prediction. I, I heard as a really great, many people listening to this will probably know this person, uh, Daniel Siegel, who's a psychiatrist and author. And he writes like the brain is basically an anticipation machine. And, and that like, that's just what it does all the time. And it's, its job is to keep us safe. So it looks in the future, looks in the future, looks in the future, wants to, wants to know what's going to happen, wants to know what's going to happen, you know? And, uh, I think a lot of athletes can relate to the experience of, you know, they've got an upcoming probably goal race or something or any race sometimes. Um, and they're just like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And how fast am I going to run? Who else is there? Can't, you know, how am I going to yeah. finish? Like it's a looping, looping, looping. Right. And that's just like the brain doing what brains do, which is trying to find certainty in the unknown, in the meaningful mm -hmm. unknown. So, so I'd say performance anxiety typically arises just from something mattering. Um, and that, the outcome of that thing being unknown until it's done. So, um, and the brain doing it's anticipating that it does. Um, one thing about it is I think, you know, one of the issues that probably the primary issue that a lot of us have with performance anxiety is it just feels bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like it feels horrible. So, you know, people, I'll ask people, where do you feel, in, you know, anxiety in your body or nervousness and they'll say stomach and head and limbs and throat and heart. And these are like all the most typical places. So it's just uncomfortable feelings um, and then, and then our brain also has a tendency to interpret ambiguous, uncomfortable things as negative. So, so we, you know, we approach this like environment that we consider meaningful yet unknown. So our brain goes, Oh geez. And like creates all these, you know, the, the physiological reaction that is anxiety. And then the brain goes, and that's bad. I don't know what this is. So that's bad and a threat. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so, so, the, so basically our brain just has a reflexive way of dealing with these environments, um, and, and dealing with our own response, but in actual fact, our nerves are actually the body rising to its highest capacity. So one of the great things about the brain is that when it notices that it's exposed to a, um, environment where there's a challenge that's meaningful to us, it presumes we're going to need to exert. That's like the most protective presumption to make, right? So it like, it actually starts to give like those, those nerves, like when you feel them, you're actually receiving glycogen, you're actually receiving more energy, you have access to more than you normally would. Um, you're already receiving endorphins. So pain relieving or easing neurochemicals. Um, your senses are peaking. So you see more and you hear more than you normally would. You think faster, not always better, but uh, <laughs> you know, everything's heightened. Um, so, so I'd say the first step I usually take with athletes with, performance anxiety is help them understand like why it's happening, which you kind of mm -hmm. just did, but then help them to reframe what's happening, which is, you know, your body's rising to its highest physical capacity. So actually I call them advantageous as, mm -hmm. as, as uncomfortable as they are, they're, they're advantageous where they can become, I guess, disadvantageous is um, because of our brain's tendency to interpret something ambiguous and negative as bad. Um, usually when we start to feel nervous, we start to think about everything that we are fearing or don't want to have happen. Um, and so we call these fear thoughts or fear stories. And uh, you know you're having a fear story because it's about something you don't want to have happen. Um, so a way to, to work with that is to just notice like when they're 
the physiological response of, you know, nervousness happens, notice it, notice, pull towards fear and towards the things you don't want to have happen. And, and then be like, Oh, this is, this is my brain. It is not me. It's a phrase we Mm -hmm. use a lot, or this is my brain. It is not true. And then, and then instead like really intentionally think about all the, all the great things that could happen that day Mm -hmm. in the workout, in the race. Um, you know, I literally had someone say to me, I get French fries after my race. That was their thing the other day when we were talking about nerves. So like, like think about everything you have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And then that, transforms nerves from like fear to excitement. And actually um, my understanding is, is when, when researchers have looked at like the physiological mixture of fear versus excitement, they're not exactly the same, um, but they're very, but they're very similar. And you can change the physical physiological reaction of fear into excitement by seeing the um, upcoming event as a challenge, as opposed to a threat and Mm -hmm. thinking about, thinking about um, everything that you have to gain, you can change, you can literally can transform that. Yeah. And that. Um, yeah. So that that's shit. one way. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. I just wanted to highlight one thing you said, you, it's important for us to recognize the types of thoughts we're having, like, oh, that's a fear thought. And mm-hmm. I can change that, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's so easy to just follow whatever our brain is doing and think like, oh, this is what's happening and I can't control it. But if you can label the type of thought you're having and say, okay, that's the wrong thing to be thinking right now, I can think of something better. Like instead of thinking about, oh, I'm going to blow up two miles before the finish. What am I going to do? Think about how you're going to push through when it starts getting hard towards the end. Like we only have so much time and so much mental energy, right? So we could either use that time to think about the bad things that could happen or we mm-hmm. could use that energy to think about the good things that could happen and like practice that. So why not use that time to think about it going well rather than it going poorly? Yeah. And you, you know, a minute ago you asked like, what's the value of mental, you know, mental training and um, yeah, you're so right. Like, like I so saw one of the things based upon what you just said is, is, you know, mental training get, can, can, help you become aware that there's a choice, you know, between, Mm -hmm. between the fear thoughts and excitement thoughts, let's say. Um, I think it also helps you uh, understand. It helps you be able to challenge the accuracy of the fear thoughts too. Mm -hmm. Um, Cause oftentimes it's not, it's oftentimes the, the problem that nerves cause athletes is not even like, Oh, I'm having bad thoughts is actually, they're not even noticing it's their thoughts. They're noticed. They, they think it feels like the truth or it's right. like going mm-hmm. to happen. It's like reality. You know, yeah. they said, no, we don't always get even as far as like, I'm having a thought. It's like, mm-hmm. Oh no, this is going to happen to me. Um, one of the more interesting tidbits of research I heard some years ago was that when we experience fear, shame, and anger, um, there is a neurochemical produced with those emotions that, that the purpose of that is to make them feel like the truth. Oh, but we don't, but we don't f- get that with like, positive emotions. So. <laughs> well, that's not right. <laughs> it's just, it's just, we're just so like, it's our, our, our natural instincts. Oh gosh. They are something like yep. <laughs> when it comes to telling us what's true about ourselves and our life and this challenge upcoming, you know, what it means yeah. about us and all that. Yeah. I've got to say another thing that was helpful for me. um, I had a boss a few years ago who was a big David Goggins fan (laughs) and he gave me his book and I read it and, you know, it's an incredible story, right? Like what he's been able to accomplish is just unbelievable. But a term he used really helped me. He taught, you know, we all have an inner critic, right? Like that voice that tells us like we're going to fail, but he calls it our inner bitch. And I think that's just such a great term because it helps you like separate yourself from that <laughs> voice, right? Like, yes, yes. When you start getting those negative thoughts, like this is really not me. This mm-hmm. is that inner critic, and I'm going to shut it up because it's yeah. not being helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, like frames that voice as like just an asshole, essentially. Yeah. And it's uh-huh. not like it's not true about you. It's not helping you. It's like would yep. you listen to? Would you listen to that 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 bitch or that asshole in real life? No, you'd just call them that, right? And, yeah, and and no, not to their face, maybe, but you would—that's how you consider them. And <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Um, so if an athlete is really struggling with performance anxiety, like I've had so many teammates who like throw up before every race mm-hmm. and that of course, that's no longer a good level of arousal, right? Like now that's affecting your ability to physiologically perform. So Mm -hmm. what are some strategies people can use to kind of help modulate that level of arousal so they don't get to that point of throwing up or like visibly shaking on the line? Like what can people do to tamp that down a little bit? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so I'd say, um, and and for sure, I think what you're talking about are people for whom their nerves get really quite excessive to the point that they're really compromising their Mm -hmm. really hampering their enjoyment and then probably also really compromising their performance and um well one thing that i'll do and i think can help really help people is is really create a a plan um for what they're going to do in the race and sometimes like and so what i mean by that is like like something i do with athletes a lot is probably like one of the most common tools i use is we design this thing called a loose plan and the loose plan is where we break, we break the race into chunks and we're like, okay, or well, actually we start, we start out by, I get the athlete to tell me if you could execute this race precisely the way you'd want. So we focus on like what the choices they make and what they do. Um, I get them to tell me that. And then we break it into chunks and then they basically come out of our conversation with a plan. So I actually like really my, probably the last athlete I spoke with before this talk was a it's an 800 meter runner. So it's a bit of a different distance, but the, the many people listening, maybe, but the premise is exactly this. It's exactly the same. So the reason he came to talk to me is he was debilitatingly nervous before his most recent race. And, um, and so we recognize that part of the reason for that was probably just, he struggles with the unknown in circumstances that matter with him. So we decided we're going to create some known within the known of the unknown, some known within the unknown. Mm-hmm. And we're going to decide some, we're going to decide in advance some decisions that he's going to make. Um, so we made a decision that he's going to focus on first lap, like first, it was like first 300 of the race, focus on position, fit positions, first priority. Then he's going to stick in position for the next middle, like the middle 400 of the 800. Uh, and then he's going to focus on form in the last 200. Mm-hmm. And I think honestly have, and one thing you'll notice about that is regardless of where he is in the race, regardless of who's around him, if he's leading, well, leading the race or back of the race, he can do all those things. You know, he can focus on position the best he can. He can stick to the person around him, regardless of where he's at. And he can focus on form at the end of the race. So that's the key to a good loose plan is you can do it no mm-hmm. matter what's going on around you. And that gives you a sense of control, a little bit of a sense of control and some knowns. Yeah. Um, and that, uh, that alone can like bring down, um, high level of it of a high level of anxiety and we do it with the marathon too we break the marathon into 5k chunks or five mile chunks or however the athlete wants to do it um but same it's like for the same purpose and with the same idea you create knowns within the unknown and then that can help you um calm down i one one thing i've realized is that i think the athletes are nervous about the outcome for sure like they do want a certain outcome in a race But I think they're equally nervous that they're not going to be the person they want to be in the race. Mm -hmm. Like they're not, they're not going to make themselves proud. They're not going to make the right choices. They're not, you know, they're not going to do everything they could do. Like if I was to talk to an athlete about what they want from their athletic career, practically everybody says, I just want to know I reached my potential or I did Mm -hmm. everything. I did everything I could do, you know? So I think um, another, another big beauty of the loose plan is it create some confidence in the athlete. They're going to be the person they want to be in the race. Um, So that's a pretty like cognitive, like, like planning oriented way. Um, Outside of that, honestly, I use, I use a lot of the breath, like meditation, meditation with the breath. So the belly Mm -hmm. breath. So um, with somebody who is, who is throwing up or gets to the point of throwing up or really, really shaking out, it's just like, go for a walk, set your timer for five minutes, breathe with a soft belly and let your attention rest on the breath. And dig, do do it like and don't like set the timer because otherwise most of us will stop. To, you know, <laughs> yeah. like well, uh-huh. you, you have to do it to the timer. But the the belly breath um, activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Which, again, you're all going to know you're more about mm-hmm. than me. Uh, but it, it just helps calm the body down and, yep. and stops like that physiological response to perceived threat. Really, is mm-hmm. what it's doing. 
Yeah. Have you read uh, Lauren Fleshman's new book? No. It's it's excellent. I would highly recommend it. And one of the things she wrote about is a something she did, I think, from like middle school on is it was like a tradition her team had is before a race, they would all go like in a field, you know, like outside of the track and just lay down flat in the grass and just like completely ground themselves. Nice. And she said yes. that like she did that like through her professional career and it was always a method that just helped her like focus and tune out, you know, all the external noise and pressure. Yeah. And I think because nature is also a very good way of like centering yeah. yourself, right? Yeah. Or like noticing external beauty. Um so I think everybody just has their a specific thing is probably going to work better for one person than another. Um, yeah. One of my good friends and training partners, she could be in the middle of, you know, a race and she'll be like looking around at like the trees and, yes. you know, and I just can't do that. But for her, it like it helps her not focus on how she feels. And she yeah. does Ironman, so she's got a lot of practice um, not focusing on how she feels. But just finding ways to get out of your own head and yeah. see the bigger picture, I guess. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I think like, grounding, that's another really great that's another really great method to, to calm yourself. And mm -hmm. I think you're like the nice thing about the grounding is you can really incorporate nature, right? Like, um, yeah. like I learned flesh and laying in the grass. Like I could totally see that being so helpful for athletes. Oh, I remember yeah. I used to have one athlete I worked with that when we met, we would go walk on the grass with bare feet, mm -hmm. We'd, like walk around the infield of the track, actually walk around with bare feet. I always enjoyed it. It always yeah. made me feel better, you know? <laughs> it does. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I'd support that a lot. And actually I'd also support um, your friend who looks around in the race. There's like a pain management technique where you like take, you like check out your pain with curiosity and then you take in the space mm -hmm. and then you, ref you, you check in out your pain again with curiosity, but with awareness of the space mm -hmm. and this kind of back and forth use of the attention tends to um, minim like it'll, it'll can help that pain feel like less. Uh, right. perceive it as less yeah yeah and that's a technique that we actually use in physical therapy as well it. It, it, you can become so hyper aware of the part of your body that hurts you know you are ignoring everything else around you so even just paying attention to another part of your body like if yes. your right knee is hurting while you're running well think about like your left elbow or something yes. totally benign and when you shift your attention to something else it's amazing how your perception of pain in that other area decreases. Yes. No, that's cool. Do you, you know, a lot of our listeners are long distance runners. So what would you, I know you touched a little bit about on like strategies to kind of help chunk a marathon, but for people who, you know, the marathon is so long, right. And so much has to go right to have, you know, the ideal outcome or like the optimal outcome. What advice do you give to your athletes about like the different stages of the race? Because, you know, the beginning of a marathon normally feels pretty easy and you've got to get mm -hmm. through that part without like pushing too hard. Right. And it's almost like a waiting game for the end of the race where it's always going to get harder. So mm -hmm. how what do you tell your long distance running athletes how to be patient during a marathon? How do you help them mm, yeah. do that? Man, yeah, the marathon's interesting. And I, it's funny, like, I've even reflecting even a little bit. 10K and the marathon are obviously clearly different. Um, but the 10K is, like, the longest track race, we yeah. let, typically. And um, it just makes me reflect that, like, the advice that I give and then the advice that coach, good co I've heard good coaches give and even, like, very good at marathoners and 10K runners have said is to just want to like, get that first chunk done with mm -hmm. as little effort and thought, like both emotional and physical effort uh, yeah. and cognitive effort as possible. You can like get that done. So you have as much uh, that first part done. So you have as much left as possible at the later in the later in the race. Um, so I would say, how do I help them? Well, you know, breaking it, breaking the effort into chunks and having a focus to keep, um, 
the effort easy that mm-hmm. works for the athletes. And we're not one of the best metaphors. This actually came from uh, she's funny, one of my NA, old NAU athletes who has not run a marathon. He was giving advice to his friend. It was he, he goes, he goes, he goes, you got to sink to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> and, then, and like, I want to like that. Just like that was kind of like the en- his energy. The me- so, so the, where I'm going with this is like come up with a metaphor or a thought yeah. or something that brings the right feeling into you and your body. Uh-huh. And for him, like sink to the bottom of the ocean was like yeah. the right fe- the right feeling. Is like 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 let go at the yeah. you know stay, like drop into your pace, drop into your relaxed pace, and then slowly rise to the surface was like the was 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 the metaphor um lots of athletes i know will just they'll break the race up and they'll just say they'll have a little mantra like relax form fluids relax Mm -hmm. form fluids like something something like that is always very very low intensity Mm -hmm. um mike smith nau coach uh will will tell them all to go to sleep uh-huh. Uh, for a f- however many miles before like the race begins. Yep. Um, so yeah, I'd say a, a, a metaphor, a calming mantra that you use in a um, pre- pre-planned chunk of the, for mm-hmm. a pre-planned chunk of the race um, and that you practice and practice too. Um, mm-hmm. When we do these plans for races, we ideally want to do them about a month beforehand. So there's several workouts that can be done practicing your focus plan over top of the race. Um, I also am like, especially in the marathon in particular, personally really cool with an athlete having a pace limit, Mm -hmm. you know, like using their watch and sometimes, you know, watch is a touchy thing for some people. It depends like in what race and if you want to use it or don't want to use it. But um, I I think an athlete having a committing to not, going out of a certain range early yeah. in, in marathons can be a really good, really good thing to do, especially if they have a habit of going too fast early on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Cause with the marathon, it, you're, it's not, you're not going to know that your early pace was too hard until it's too late. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to, listen to your coach. Yep. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> no matter how you're feeling, no matter how you're feeling. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, one more question about performance anxiety before we moved on to talking about injury. But a lot of people struggle with anxiety during workouts or even like before workouts, like people who, you know, most of our listeners are not professional athletes. So you've got a job, you go, go to work and you're thinking about, oh, I've got that really tough workout to do after work. Like how, what would you tell someone who struggles with that? Like how do approach that workout, how to change their thinking about it. Maybe it's something they haven't done before, or it's the pace that's been prescribed is a little bit harder than they think they can do. How can you calm yourself so you're not stressing about it, you know, five hours before you're actually doing it? Yeah, I think that's such a really hard, I think it's a really hard situation to be in is like, I know there's like, parents of a couple children who work full-time jobs and then go do a workout after work or get up at four to do it. Like yeah. there's a, there's an outrageous amount of commitment um, mm-hmm. in a lot of working professionals towards their, like towards their endurance sport, which is, which is pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, I think, um, man, I think, I honestly think a little bit of acceptance goes a long way here, you know, mm-hmm. like, like I think, um, with somebody who let's say they just have a full time job and then they need to go do a workout that's going to take two hours to get done from yeah. or more from warm up to conclusion, you know, and they're maybe partway through the workday just 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 stressing because it's just feels like a lot. Is um, I wouldn't fight that feeling a little too much. I, I, too much. I would I would give yourself a little bit of compassion and be like, this thing you're doing is difficult. And it's, 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 it, it is challenging. It's challenging for a person. We do have limits like in exertion, both in cognitive, emotional, physical exertion, you know? And so it's extremely normal and understandable to be, to be part way through a work day and be like, geez, I have a two and a half hour workout tonight. Like that feels like a lot. That's, mm-hmm. that's, I think that's understandable. So I, I think, um, noticing that and accepting it and giving yourself just like a little bit of like understanding and care for feeling that way. I think sometimes we don't know. I I think sometimes our distress is caused by ourselves judging ourselves for how we feel like Mm -hmm. somebody could be partway through that workday 
and they're like, I have 10 by a K on the track after work today. And they're kind of feeling stressed and anxious and tense. And then they're like, it's not that big a deal. It's only two and a half laps. You just have to do it 10 times. You've done this like 300 times, you know, you know, uh-huh. like it, it doesn't matter. Like, it, you know, it's only one workout. And like, that's how we like come back at ourselves. Right. And then our judgment actually feeds our distress. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think first step is like, no, what you're doing is lots. It's a lot. <laughs> you know, there's reasons people aren't doing it. Yeah. So other people aren't doing it. Like <laughs> most people are so, going home like, and watching Netflix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's supposed to be, it's hard because it's supposed to be hard and yeah. it's okay that you're feeling like it's a lot, you know? And I, I even feel like that step sometimes mi- will minimize some distress because you're you, but we're not always aware we're judging ourselves, our reaction, but mm-hmm. if we can, we, that, that's a way of letting go of some judgment. We might not even know we have. And then, yeah, like, um, I personally, like, like, tell you what works like for me, um, is just like human beings do have limits and the best you can do is the best is the best you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to, you're going to do that and um, kind of tr- like trying to tell yourself, you know, trusting that you're, you're going to do that. And, and then I take commit to commit to the appropriate effort. That's what so many coaches say too, right? They don't necessarily want athlete forcing the effort to hit a split. They'll say, right. they'll say, Hey, like this is a, this is a pace range. So, you know, I don't want you racing the workout. So commit to the appropriate effort and trust you're going to do your best. And, and it's in one, like one interval at a time. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think the, I you know the overriding thing when I think about that scenario is just like, it's so natural that that is hard on people. Yeah. Like, like yeah. that, that pro- prospect is hard on people. Yeah. And I yeah. think, I think what you just said is also applicable to anyone who has, you know, a full-time job or, who is a stay at home parent or takes care of an elderly family member and is trying to be a marathon racer or trying Mm -hmm. to run a certain amount every week. Like what we're doing is hard and it's good to like give yourself that compassion, like you said, and just acknowledge that, yeah, it's, it would probably feel nicer to go home and lay on the couch and do nothing, (laughs) but we're choosing to do more than that. And it's okay for that to feel stressful at times, but in the end, it's our choice and we're doing it because we, you know, running is a big part of who, you know, what we care about and what we enjoy doing. So that's why we're making that choice to not go flop down on the couch when we get out of work. No, exactly. And I I like that you frame it like that. And it's also, you're also like choosing it. So you have other choices too, right? Like you're choosing it. So you have the choice to go run a marathon at a certain pace, or you're choosing it. So you have the choice to go to that cool part of the world and run 20 K of trails in a park, you know, or keep up with your kid or, Mm -hmm. you know, like, like there's all sorts of reasons why like that workout at the end of the day is hard, but you're you're choosing it so that you actually have the choice to do other things that people, others maybe can't do, or you just value. It doesn't even have to matter. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think, I think that'll be very helpful for a lot of people. Um, (laughs) Good. So let's move on to talking about injury. And of course, you know, people may be listening thinking, okay, injury is a physical injury. So why are we talking about this with a mental performance person? But injury <laughs> is not just a physical injury. It it has a huge effect on us mentally, mm-hmm. right? Um, so can you tell us why exactly that is? And like, why why should a physical injury affect our mental health so much? And also, if someone is dealing with an injury, what are some strategies that you would recommend to help with their mental health during the recovery process? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, for anybody who is, you know, for whom their sport is a big part of their life, um, when we get hurt, oftentimes that, that's a big hit to regular routines and practices, right? So it, it, I think, first of all, can derail activities that we would normally do and be doing which we don't really like that we don't like big disruption to our to our life and our routines um and and i think you know many of us um have meaningful hopes uh, attached to why we're training so it can be like the threat a threat to those hopes or even the loss of them depending on the severity of the injury and time frame 
and so on. Um, and I think, I think, um, and then so we can, we also, many of us have a sense of identity and value and community wrapped up in those, in those hopes, you know, or being at a certain level of fitness. Um, it wouldn't be abnormal. I'm guessing there's lots of people who are listening to this, who are working professionals who have, uh, are running, maybe they meet up a couple times a week with, with a friend or a group to do a workout. They have a couple other people they meet at 5 a.m. to do, to go for a run. Everyone's working towards Chicago and like, you know, and then you get hurt and all of a sudden, not only do you not have your ritual, you're not sure if you're going to Chicago, all your friends are. And so this is like, this, this hit, this takes a big, we take a hit to our community and our perception of our like social belonging. So it's like, there's so many good reasons why an injury rocks us. You know, mm-hmm. it's like your routine, your goals, your a little bit value. Sometimes your community, your friendships um, can all feel like they hang on this thing, um, which are like huge human vulnerabilities, you know, all these things. So, so that it has a, big emotional impact on us is, is, um, is really understandable. Um, I think it's a couple of like, I think there's a couple of, of, of inaccurate beliefs that athletes experience when they're hurt that aren't always even conscious, but I think they lurk emotionally. Um, and like the, the bad, just the bad feeling of being hurt. One of them, one of them is somehow I, my social, my relationships were threatened. Um, that's one. And then the other one is I'm never going to get well and, or it's never going to get better, which is so mm-hmm. interesting. You know, like there's this, like I taught you, you probably see so many injured athletes and yeah. right? And like, I see plenty of injured athletes and see, I see injury occur. I mean, so many, I, I, I think of any athlete I've talked to over the past year, probably, someone's had something or a little setback or a big setback or whatever. So, so you can see injury as a natural part of being an athlete, natural part of sport. But when it's me or, or it's you, it's like, Whoa, this, and this might never get better. This is like yeah. a, a significant problem. Like shouldn't have happened. That can be like a, a, a feeling. So it's, it's interesting that that's something deep down can believe that. So I'd say just kind of like ask like, man, am I, am I feeling socially disconnected? Am I feeling fear that this will never resolve? Even if it's irrational, it helps to acknowledge it if it's actually happening. And then mm-hmm. again, like offer yourself a bit of compassion and care. Cause that's just a, honestly, just a, another brain reaction to threat. It's like making up fear stories that feel true, that aren't true. Um, and then as far as working with it, um, I say, I really think the more an injured athlete, if, can stay involved in their athletic community. If that's a thing for them, mm-hmm. the more an injured athlete can stay involved with their athletic community by far the better. Some people will be like, Oh, I don't want to go to the workout. It just makes me feel sad. Mm-hmm. Ah, but then you add to that, the social disconnection and like co- compound for yourself. What I think a lot of the reasons why uh, injuries are hard on people. So I'd say like stay as socially involved as you, as you can. Yep. Um, and, and, um, do your best to call out that, you know, injury is a natural part of being an athlete. It's as part of, I'd say it's almost as much as being an athlete as training and rest that we have these periods where something goes a little wrong. It's nothing wrong with you. It's just, it is part of the sport. Um, there's an exercise I do with athletes, especially if they are, if it's a lengthy injury or it appears to be, and we're really not sure how long it's going to take for it to be better. And I draw this from, um, a psychologist called Viktor Frankl who wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, but he mm-hmm. also wrote a book called The Will to Meaning. Well, you wrote a bunch of books, but that's the other one I've read. And he has this method for dealing with kind of unknown, like like suffering of unknown duration. And he he's basically says, uh, ask yourself, what am I going to give to this circumstance? Like the circumstance is what it is. What am I going to give to it? So like, what am I going to contribute? What am I going to uh grow what how am I going to use the time in a constructive way I guess you could say for with, with respect to injury he'll also ask what am I going to allow what am I going to allow this to give me um and that can be a hard one sometimes when someone's hurt it's like I don't know the 
better swimmer like you know but um <laughs> a new elliptigo champion <laughs> seriously yeah yeah but I've had athletes be like patience I've, mm-hmm. I've also had athletes say like man I I kind of I didn't really understand what it was like to be hurt I really mm-hmm. think I haven't been as caring or compassionate towards like my teammates or other friends when they've been hurt so I'm yeah. gonna let it give me understanding Mm -hmm. Um, and then the third question of that exercise is what attitude are you going to take? What stance, what attitudinal stance are you going to take on this? So, so it could be, you know, the attitudinal stance of, well, I'm in the injury interval. Uh, I'm using this, I'm going to use this period to, um, here's a, here's a common one, correct some like physiological weakness. So you could let me Uh know, like I'm going to do those, I'm going to do those (laughs) exercises that I never do. Uh-huh. <laughs> to make me better, right? Uh, and I'm gonna see it as a I'm gonna I'm gonna see it as ways to a, a way to grow in other areas. So that's one stance, as opposed mm-hmm. to I see it as a tragedy. And my yeah. dreams are over, and why am I so messed up about this? And so, so cho- he says the most important one is to choose your attitude on mm-hmm. the the meaning of the yeah. circumstance. Yeah, yeah, I love that, and I. Have personally experienced all of those. Um, about 10 years ago, when I was still bike racing, I had a neck injury and I couldn't ride as it ended up for a year. Wow. And, you know, like I said, cycling was my life and my identity. And it was very devastating to not be able to ride. And mm-hmm. eventually, you know, I was fortunate to have a friend who happens to be a sports psychologist. So <laughs> she, uh, she definitely helped me out. But You know, one of the biggest things was staying connected to the community. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had no desire to go watch a bike race or be involved at all in a bike race. But my friend said to me, she I had mentioned that another friend had asked me to coach her. And I I thought that was the dumbest idea ever. Like I wasn't a coach. I didn't want to be a coach. I'm a bike racer, you know. And then she's like, Well, why not? You would be a great coach. And, you know, I thought about it and it took me a while and I was like, okay, I'm going to do that because at least then like, I'm still part of the cycling world. I can share my knowledge with someone else. So I took my friend on as a coaching client and it, it made all the difference in the world to, because it still made me feel like I was part of the community and exactly, I was yep, sharing yep my knowledge and experience with her and celebrating her victories. Um, So I definitely agree. Like whether it's, you know, if you're a high school or college athlete, you still go to practice. You still Mm -hmm. go to all of the meets. If you're, you know, just a, you know, adult who likes to run and now you can't, maybe you can't run with your friends, but still go meet them for coffee after their run. Yes. Or like, If you can walk, but you can't run, maybe your running friends will like come walk with you on their easy days, like find a way to stay connected for sure. And absolutely it like for me, it was all about like finally like stopping being so like down on myself, like I can't ride, like everything sucks and like changing my mindset to I can't ride. So I need to figure out something else. And like, as you know, doing that, it like, it freed me. And I actually got to the point where I was like, well, maybe I'm not going to be able to ride again. And I was actually okay with that. And it wasn't soon after that, that I actually like got to the point where I could start riding again. But I feel like, (laughs) you know, I had to get to that point where I was okay, not being a cyclist anymore. And I think that that has actually helped me even with my running now like I don't have to have running I don't have to have cycling I love them but I don't you know I'm not so dependent on them like I used to be and like it was all about changing how I thought about things yes yeah Yeah. now man you've got some experience with this (laughs) yes unfortunately um but (laughs) You know, the other thing I wanted to bring up as a PT, um, I think one of the hardest things for people is when they're dealing with their first major injury. So maybe you're dealing with a teenager who, you know, tore their ACL or they have a stress fracture. And like, 
they've never seen that you can recover from being hurt like this. Mm -hmm. Or, and I mean, there are some adults who have never been injured and their first major injury is when they're in their thirties or Mm forties. And again, it's just, they have no experience with the recovery process. So they just think it's over Mm -hmm. and helping them to understand, like, like you said, injury is basically a part of running. Like the statistics are like the vast majority of runners are going to get injured at some point. So it's not if, but when, and then when it does happen to an individual, helping them deal with it, both from a physical perspective and from a mental perspective. Um, And I think, you know, people's community can play a big role. So if one of your friends is injured and you can't run, you know, they can't run with you anymore, make sure to like still invite them for coffee or, you know, go walk Mm -hmm. with them or whatever, like help them stay part of the community. Because mm-hmm. then when it's your turn to be that injured person, you know, maybe your friends will do the same thing for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So can we talk a little bit about when somebody's finally ready to return to their sport? It's so common for people to be actually fearful of going back to training because they don't want to get injured again. So one, they're like, they're afraid to do the thing that caused their pain, whether it was like, running on hills or doing track work or, you know, doing a certain type of strength training, whatever they attributed their injury to, they're a little bit afraid of it. Um, How do you help people get over that? Like what, what techniques work for you? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you one thing that I'm fascinated about that you would definitely know more about than I do, but I've always intended to learn is like essentially like pain theory. And Mm -hmm. like some of the neurological elements of pain and like how you physios work with people's perception of pain when an area is supposed to be healed, but the brain doesn't trust that. Right. And like the Mm -hmm. things that you do. So I feel like I could ask, (laughs) ask you about that. Um, but we're not right now, we're not really talking about pain that is not, let's say not real or not reflective of damage. Let's say we're not talking about that. We're talking about them just being afraid. Yeah. Um, I would say probably a couple things on that. Um, I think the first thing I'd probably bring up again is the, like the brain's negativity bias and it's, it's tendency to um, see the worst likelihood and the worst possibility in ambiguous unknown situations. Um, So I would just, you know, probably ask somebody like, Hey, what, like, what's your thought process? How are you feeling? And what's your thought process before you go to that workout or before you go to that run? Like, what are you, what are you believing? How does it, how does it feel in your body? Cause, um, we all, we often talk about that. And then, um, we'll talk about how, like, Hey, like your doctor, your physio, your coach, we have every reason to believe like you're okay to start doing a workout today or, 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 or doing a run. Um, and I might point out like, Hey, like our brain has a tendency to have a negativity bias and it means it predicts the worst in an ambiguous and unknown situation. And, uh, so I, I, I don't know that your mind is telling you the, like the right thing and, and pretty much invite them to challenge that, you know, and, um, probably we talk about their options and their choices. And usually, usually where they're at is if they don't get training pretty soon, they're going to like lose out on some opportunity, you know, mm-hmm. and, and they'll like, they'll acknowledge that. So, um, yeah, just, just try to look at the evidence, acknowledge how they feel, look at the evidence, talk about how the brain works, ask them, what are your choices? Um, and then I think create a plan to take it one step at a time, you know, like, like maybe we'll do the first interval and see how it feels. And if it feel, still feels okay, we'll do one more. There's no commitment to doing the whole thing or, or do one mile and then yeah. we'll use a three mile, you know, see how it feels. Mm-hmm. So a commitment to, 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 to one, to one step at to one step at a time. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's under it is understandable though. It's, um, especially when athletes can experience so much struggle with their mental health around injury, they just don't, don't want to end up back there. Right. Like right. it's so distressing and hard for them. So yeah. 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 Just one step at a time, one mile, see how it goes. That yeah. mile was good. Go on to the next mile. Yeah. 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 Kind of how well, you would, chunk of race, right? <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, it is. It is. I think like sometimes uh, it's funny what fear can do too, because 
like a typical scenario is maybe I have, like say a college athlete come and they're like, Oh, I've had a hamstring issue. And you know, coach, this coach Smith says I should do the threshold workout today, but I'm really not sure it's okay. Like it feel it's felt fine for a week, but I'm not sure it's okay. And this, this perception, I have to do the whole thing. And it's like, no, no, no not necessarily like, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Yeah. That's, those are some good tips. Thank you. Um, one more question regarding injury and I guess just identity. And, you know, I talked a little bit about like what I experienced with my cycling injury, but I think it's so common to, no matter what sport or what hobby you're involved with, we tend to strongly identify with what we do, whether we're a mm -hmm. runner or we're, you know, we make quilts or we ride horses or whatever, like that's a big part of our identity, right? And it's yeah. good to have, you know, a strong identity, but when you derive too much of your identity or self-worth from one thing, you're kind of setting yourself up for a problem if that event, that uh, activity gets taken away for reasons of injury or just life or whatever. Mm -hmm. So do you talk to your athletes about like the importance of cultivating an identity outside of their sport? And if so, like, how do you, how do you help them do that? And I know a lot of your athletes are professional athletes. So that's like a whole different ball game because they really are their sport. That's their profession. But at the mm -hmm. same time, they have other identities, right? They're somebody's spouse or daughter or friend. And, you know, they might have other hobbies that they enjoy doing. So I guess, how do you help people be more than just runners? <laughs> That's a really actually hard, like hard topic. In a way, I think I have a few different angles on it as far as, um, answering that question um i i think that a lot of the reason people identify so like rigidly to sport sometimes is because sport has served some sort to be a, some sort of coping mechanism or safe space throughout their like throughout their like upbringing throughout their childhood or throughout their life so so maybe sport was a place where they perform well, their parents are happy and they had stuff to talk about and, or maybe they had a great relationship with a coach and when the, they perform well, they could feel that connection. Or maybe it was the one thing that they were able to be admired for in high school or in college. So I think a, a lot of our reason our identity is, is, is tied to sport is because it's served a purpose in helping us cope or thrive or feel confident or safe, like in our, in our upbringing. So the way that I'll usually go with an athlete who's struggling with, I, with identity and I'm realize I'm starting, I'm, I'm not talking proactively here. I'm talking kind of struggling with, let's say, mm -hmm. um, but I'll start with that is, um, kind of understanding what factors might have caused the athlete to identify so strongly with, with their sport. Um, and the more that they can understand those factors, like look back on their past and understand those factors, oftentimes the less their attachment feels like necessary or tr ne like necessary or critical, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, Oh man, that's understandable. Like, like really the best time I ever had with my dad was when I ran fast, mm -hmm. you know? And like, yeah. and, and that's, that's understandable why I feel like why there's this heightened emotion around it. And I feel like I need it. So understanding that actually can help, um, to kind of loosen it and mm -hmm. help someone to be open to who else they could be. Um, and, um, and then as far as, as far as like growing it, I think it's funny. I've never had any, say I've like never had any success trying to get someone to like intentionally grow their identity if they don't like naturally, if they're not right. naturally drawn to something. Mm -hmm. which is a bit unfortunate, yeah. right? Like you kind of like wish you could be like, what else do you like? Oh, go on for read about birds. <laughs> uh -huh. And then, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the athletes I know, they really, a lot are interested in other things genuinely, but a lot aren't really. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, um, definitely with the ones that have even the inkling of another sort of interest, I'll like get enthusiastic about it and feed yeah. it and want to know mm -hmm. more about it and like express my opinion that it has value um, and encourage them to develop community around that thing. Because um, when they can see that others value the thing they're interested in, they'll value it more. And so they'll mm -hmm. naturally like, expand their comfort level with having a broader identity. Um, but um, yeah, I really think, 
especially with young athletes. So I say young, I mean anything under, well, maybe we're all young, <laughs> but, uh, but like just, just anytime somebody else validates the value of your other interest or mm-hmm. expresses that they value other things, um, equal to, or more than sport that helps you, like yeah. that helps us. So I'd say, yeah, the way that I help try to help people the most is communicate many interests, communicate many values, praise them for the praise them, ask questions, be interested in elements mm-hmm. of them outside of running. Yep. Um, encourage them to spend time doing things outside of running that they genuinely enjoy. Some people have a belief they just can't have other interests. And mm-hmm. then if they have other interests, they don't care or they're settling or they're less intense. And there's a like belief around that, which mm-hmm. isn't true. Right. So, so sometimes we discover that, you know, but just like, yeah, like I have like one athlete who can play, the, who likes to play the guitar and I'll like, like, Hey, like for your, for your, the sake of your racing, play your guitar more, like, right. like, mm-hmm. like set aside time for that, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I find it genuinely, genu- like in my experience, it has to be something that they, they are genuinely passionate about. Mm-hmm. And you like, look for the little spark of that. And then you yeah. try to feed it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess if somebody listening was like, Oh yeah, running is pretty much my identity. I should like try to f- think about what where those other sparks are and maybe yes. try to cultivate them. Would that be your advice? Definitely. Think yeah. about other sparks. Think about ways you can get involved with other people around them. Mm-hmm. That that could be one. Or another thing is just to notice things that you already do that are of value that you just might not be valuing. Mm-hmm. You know, like like maybe you're really good at your job, regardless of what your job is. Maybe you're a really good parent. Maybe, you're, you know, or, or like trying really hard, to like doing this really hard job of parenting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these things are, I mean, these are enormously important. You know, it's funny. This might be a bit controversial, but like one, I haven't brought this up a lot, um, but I will at some point. I know this with athletes, but I really think sport is like, uh, it's kind of, it's an art form, you know, art, it's like mm-hmm. art form. Sport is an art form alongside music and painting and et cetera. And um, sport is like a symbol of, stretching and courage and hard work and persistence, you know, but it's a sim, it's like, it's a symbol. And one of the things I sometimes think about sport is like, it's something athletes do in this kind of artificial environment, you know, like, mm-hmm. like that this matters yep. that in the real world. It's kind mm-hmm. of an artificial environment. It's a con, it can be a contribution so that people who are doing things in life that objectively probably matter a bit more, like, you have a sick kid at home. You're you're running a nonprofit that's really helping people. Like you know, it gives mm-hmm. it's a symbolism. It's a, it's a symbol for people who are doing things in the world to like take courage in the area of in the thing they're doing in their life. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's a it's an art form to inspire. Right. Um, so, what other art forms do you have in your life that that are actually of equal or greater value than sport being a parent, being a spouse, yeah. being like whatever you do in your life, you know, mm-hmm. like we just don't value, I, we, we don't value other things as much sometimes. Right. Um, yeah. I love so. that. That's such a great description and it's so true. Yeah. We, the things that we place the greatest value on are not always the things that have the greatest value in the end. Right. No, no. And not that they're not valuable. Yeah. They're awesome. And mm-hmm. we shouldn't feel proud if we yeah. get a PR you know? <laughs> <But> <laughs> yeah, those are really awesome to do. But yeah, we don't, are. we don't give ourselves credit for all of the other awesome and hard things we do that, you know, don't involve getting a medal or like, you know, a cool Strava post or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it's, and you say that, I think, I think, you know, as a society, we've kind of done it to ourselves, you mm-hmm. know, like we, 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 the way we treat, the way we view good athletes we really, yeah. we, we, we idolize them quite a lot right so um we haven't like as a greater society we haven't done a great job of uh, helping us in that way <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah well yeah thank you for those thoughts that i think that'll be helpful for a lot of our listeners um do you have any closing thoughts for our listeners just to, if somebody is interested in talking to you or talking to somebody who does what you do how do I mean, we're going to put Shannon's contact information in the show notes. Um, but is there like a, a database of mental performance consultants where people can go? Uh, what should yeah. people look for? Yeah, there is a um, organization, a U.S. based organization called oh gosh, 
American Applied Sports Psychology Association, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can, like, that um, is an organization that basically, like, certifies and helps educate and also provide or provide access to mental performance consultants and sports psychologists around the country. So that's a good place for people. If you want to try to find someone near you or maybe have a little bit of choice as to, or places to find people or even are interested in the field, it's Mm -hmm. a good, it's a really good resource for finding people um, in the field. Um, And yeah, when it comes to working with anyone and it's funny, I say in particular, like, mental health, mental performance, but it's true in everything, like busy yeah. everything. Mm-hmm. The degree to which you connect with the person is actually like the most important thing. So um, you can look at credentials and accomplishments and testimonials and all that, but, but really the deciding factor for any of us working with a professional like that is like, do I feel safe and comfortable and understood? And do mm-hmm. I look forward to talking with them? So yeah. that would be like my number one tip for finding a probably professional in anything but in my field anyway or like absolutely yeah yeah even for PT so much of it is about finding someone you have a rapport with because if you don't if you don't trust that person or if you can't communicate well with that person you're probably not going to get the most out of your time together of course no yeah yeah Um, well, thank you everyone. Thanks Shannon so much for coming on. This has been a great episode. Um, like I said, we'll put all of Shannon's contact info in the show notes. Um, for our listeners, you can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave us a review. It really helps us out to grow. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, Leave them in the comments, or you can send us an email at doctorsofrunning at gmail.com. Thanks so much, Shannon, um, for taking time out of your day to talk with me. Um, And thanks again. Oh, my pleasure. Well, thank you for having me.